Well, good afternoon. I'm Martin Tyner with the Southwest Wildlife Foundation, and this is our sweet, beautiful wildlife ambassador named Helen, and she's being very, very bouncy today. Um, so we're going to have a, a kind of a, a little anniversary uh, a live chat with Helen today, and uh, and we'll uh, go ahead and start with a video to kind of introduce her history uh, to us and the foundation. So go ahead and hit the video. This is someone that none of you have had a chance to meet yet. This, this is our, our new little wildlife ambassador. She is a peregrine falcon, and she has a, a, a bit of an interesting story. She came out of a captive breeding program. Hi, huh, sweetie. She came out of a captive breeding program, so she's not from the wild. Uh, unfortunately, she has some genetic problems, which makes her not suitable for falconry and also not suitable for going back in the wild. Oh, I know. That's just my hand. That's just my hand, sweetie not going back to the wild. Uh, she is incredibly nearsighted. Uh, we have our, uh, our video camera set up to, uh, taking these videos and uh, it's okay sweetie, set, taking these videos and I can promise you the camera would be nothing but a total blur to her. She, she's very, very, very nearsighted. Uh, the breeder that had her noticed that she was, you know, couldn't fly normally she'd hit walls and stuff in her chambers and and she has a, a real hard time uh, you know finding food on, if it's on the ground and she has a hard time you know finding her bath pan and and so basically you know she can see enough to sit on a perch and recover onto a perch but she can't feed herself the breeders and, and so the the breeder um was great about hand feeding her and yeah he, he, he took really care. really good care of her because she is uh she is handicapped huh sweet girl she's a little handicapped and um really the choices are either she uh becomes a wildlife ambassador and, and used as an educational animal uh or since she can't go to the wild can't be used for falconry she would have to be uh, euthanized isn't she beautiful? This is the peregrine falcon. This is the endangered species you've heard so much about. The peregrine falcon is a classic falcon. And this particular falcon, uh, it was believed in the, in the late 1960s, there was only about four dozen pairs of these left in North America. Falconers such as myself, we brought all, all of our peregrines together, created a breeding project called the Peregrine Flock. We have raised tens of thousands of these and we've turned them back to the wild. The peregrine falcon is the first animal to be removed from the endangered species list. And so they're doing very, very well. Really within 100 miles of where you're sitting, guys, I've got over 100 pairs of peregrine right here. As I see them flying over St. George all the time. Now, again, the falcon and the hawk are very, very different. Let me show you the difference. Look at the feet of the, of the falcon. Even though the toes are long, but they're very thin. And they're softer, and they're not nearly as powerful. The talons are razor sharp, but again, not nearly, as, not nearly the strength. Look how short the legs are on the falcon. The falcon hunts other birds. They hunt in the sky. I hate when you go to a program like this and they bring out a one-eyed, mangled wing, injured, horrible looking animal. Does that make sense? Basically what I want when I do my programs is I want you to look at the bird and not go, oh my God, poor thing. I want you to look at these animals and says, oh my God, she's beautiful. And so that's, that's why, you know, she's a wonderful wildlife ambassador. We named her Helen. And the reason we named her Helen is after Helen Keller, because Helen Keller was deaf and blind. Wake up. Well, that's just, go ahead. I said, wake up. I'm, I'm awake. <laughs> uh, so yes, he Helen is and has been a wonderful addition to our educational programs. Um, you know, she's still uh, very, very much disabled. Uh, she and I have been together for three years now, and and we've enjoyed our time together. Uh, one of the things that you notice with um, with people who have uh, uh, disabilities and animals as well is they become very, very strongly set into their routines because routine is everything to them. And so she's going to be a little bit bouncy. Yes, you are today for the simple fact that she's used to getting up uh, at about seven o'clock in the morning, and then we go outside, especially when the weather is nice, and and she gets fed, and she gets to take her bath, and she goes and hangs out on her perch in in the weathering yard. And it's now eleven o'clock in the morning, and she hasn't had her breakfast, and she hasn't had her bath, 
And so she's just uh, not understanding why we've broken the routine. So she's going to be a little bit bouncy here, but that's okay. We'll get her outside in a little bit, won't we, pretty girl? So um, you have questions. This is uh, an opportunity we can visit and answer questions about uh, <clears throat> about Helen and, and, uh, and about peregrines and so on. Okay, but I wanted to add two notes real quick for people. Look down in the description, and we've got a link to Helen's page at our website, and then also a link you can get. You can download a PDF that has all kinds of uh, frequently asked questions about Helen if you're interested. Okay, wonderful. So other than that, the huge topic we always get is what's the deal with her eyes? Can we get her little glasses? Can we fix them? Is there surgery? Is there is there any hope that she could ever fly in the wild? And and the 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 simple answer is no. Um, you, you know, if if you can only imagine, you know, her eyes are much much smaller than ours, and, and I can certainly understand her predicament. Uh, you know, last year I I had uh, cataract surgery in both my eyes because cataracts were developing and my vision was going down. Uh, fairly dramatically and and uh so you know the the technology is amazing to be able to do this into a human eye and to uh with literally tiny tiny instruments and and the microscope to be able to cut into the eye and and re replace the lens and, and, uh, and so that, that I have an artif artificial lens of both eyes. And so that's what was amazing that, that our technology has gotten to that point, but her eyes are, are significantly smaller and they're significantly more complex. Um, she has uh, many, many times the number of, of rods and cones in the eye than we have. The structure of the eye is, is developed it, like a camera lens where you have the ability to focus a camera out with with the adjustment of the lens to to great distances and then bring the the focal point in closer and closer uh and we and the camera does this uh if it's uh an, an auto camera does that automatically with a motor but it, you can do this by hand as well and and so the structure of the eye is is m even more complex than ours and we just do not have that kind of technology. And I'll be honest with you, the, the odds of them ever saying, oh, well, there's um, out of the, the millions and millions of peregrine falcons, there's, there's one that we know of that um, is horribly nearsighted. So let's develop a, a surgical technique to fix that. Um, it's, it's not going to happen. But that's OK. You know, she does. Uh, very very well in captivity she's a, a great wildlife ambassador she does like to in the evening times hang out in the living room and watch tv with the family and uh so she's she's really quite a quite a good kid but the answer is no um we i i seriously doubt there will ever be a any kind of a surgical technique to fix her genetic abnormality yes you are just going to be so bouncy today aren't you sweetheart Yes, you are. Yes, so you even are. if there was some magical procedure, how would they even know? I mean, if she had this procedure, how would they judge what she was seeing and how could she ever really know to judge distance and all that for flight? Well, and, and again, um, unlike humans, where we can actually sit down and tell the, the um, ophthalmologist surgeon, you know, how our eyes are seen where we, you know, we sit in a chair in the, in the exam room and they show us different lenses and they can determine with our comments, you know, how well we are seeing with, uh, you know, with these guys, they, they really can't do that. They, they would just have to literally be able to look at the, at the eye and somehow determine through measurements and things what, what the, the visual acuity is because she can't tell you. And, and so it really is not, uh, it's not, not something that, that is practical that can't be done. Um, but as, as sad as it is that she is, uh, will never be allowed to fly free, she'll never go thousands of feet in the sky, she will never dive vertically at 200 miles an hour and blow up pigeons like a wild falcon could do, uh, she will also 
never be uh, sitting out at uh, 10, 15 below zero in a snowstorm in high winds on a cliff. She will never, she will never know hunger or starvation. She will always have a, a comfortable existence. And, and like I said, we give her as much enrichment as possible, allowing her to, to uh, have uh, some mental stimulation and entertainment to help her uh, kind of pass the times with, with us uh, uh, ground-based humans. So, so she has a good life. So we, short, we sort of snuck in here for a, a surprise anniversary party for Helen. Today is three years since she became a wildlife ambassador. So we'll take questions as well. We just wanted to talk about a few things to give people time to find us. But one other question I've got now, three years with Helen, what's your favorite Helen story? My favorite Helen story, you know, you know um, I, I think the most kind of interesting thing is the, the first time she was on a, a perch up here in my living room and I perched and uh, <clears throat> I perched her um, in the corner uh, close to the television set and we turned the TV on for the family and just kind of watched her <clears throat> and uh, kept the sound very, very low because we didn't want to, to, to get her frightened. And the the activities and the movements and you know what she what she saw the light the colored lights from the television set and the screen and, and those kinds of things and the movements she was just fascinated you know where a lot of birds uh because their eyesight's so good that would be a terrifying experience yeah, they wouldn't understand what's going on but because her vision is so poor that um it, it just be it just interested her to no end um, people ask me what is her favorite show and to be honest with you, I don't think she can tell you because um, she I, I think all she sees is lights and movements she doesn't really see um, the picture um, you know clear enough to be able to identify it so so just just the time uh, to, to sit with her and let her let her see the world and see interesting things going on is 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 fascinating to watch the behavior okay we've got a question from salty australian is there a reason she would be nearsighted is it just a genetic defect it is just a genetic defect uh she was uh from the captive breeder uh she you know there there were in her clutch there were three chicks and and she was having issues where the other chicks were doing just fine but for some reason she was feeding well and so the breeder basically pulled her to to see what was going on and she looked perfectly fine there was no outside evidence of, of issues um and so he put her back and and monitored her, monitored her her and she and she just wasn't thriving she was having issues and problems and uh so the the breeder started to again bring her back so that she didn't have to com have to compete uh, in the nest with the other two, so that she would get sufficient amount of food, and and he just just found that um, she wasn't acting right, <clears throat> and and he was the one that first decided that um, there's there's obviously there's something wrong. Or it must be genetic because we don't know what the, we can't see any signs of, of problems or illnesses. And um, over the, over several months, in fact, almost a year, um, you know, he, he says that she just doesn't seem to be able to see much more than about six feet at the most. If he puts food down for her, uh, she, can't, uh, she can't find it. And so he has to put food within like three feet of her so she can see it and, and then walk over and feed herself. And, and so that's been kind of her what's going on sweetie you're being really bouncy have we disturbed your routine too much today have we that's my girl so anyway that's what it is just it was a genetic thing there's some other little genetic abnormalities that she has i don't know if you can see on this side you can see there's some feathers hanging out of place again that's abnormal they're supposed to be smooth but um turn, turn this way again let's see you can see how those those feathers back there are are sticking downward and not quite correct 
She also, and I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but you see that this one talon right here? Yeah, come on, sweetie. She moved right when it came into view. <laughs> yep. It's right here. And the talon sticks up. It doesn't curve down like it's supposed to. It sticks up. You see that? And so that makes that uh, that toe work uh, because you can't grab anything with it. That's another genetic abnormality. So there's just a lot. And we really don't know internally, you know, if there is any internal abnormalities as well. And so we really can't predict um, her life expectancy. Uh, she's been with me three years and has, has done just wonderfully. So she may have a, a long and healthy life uh, in captivity, but we, we really don't know that because of her because of her her genetics we just we just don't know but we will enjoy her and and uh and use her like i said as a wildlife ambassador uh for our school programs and scout programs and and so on and and she does that very well so that's that's a good thing so our buddy m127 found us and says "Ooh, what a nice surprise oh well thank you we're like I said, we just thought we'd come up because this is Helen's uh, third year anniversary with our foundation. So we thought we'd just go ahead and talk about her a little bit. We've got another salty visitor, salty stir fry. How many animal ambassadors do you have? Currently, I have three. I have Helen here, which is our peregrine falcon. I have uh, Scout the Golden Eagle, and I have Belle the Harris Hawk. And these are the ones that we take, uh, take out to the public. The ones that we rescue uh, are not for not to be taken to the public and not for education. We want as little human contact with the with the wildlife rescue as we can get because we want to return them back to the wild. Got another friend here, Terry Martin. She sent us a super chat for fifty dollars. Happy anniversary, Helen. Well, thank you, Terry. That's very sweet of you, and uh, and Helen appreciates it too. That's uh, that represents. Um, uh, 50 mice or 25 quail. So that's a, that's a, a more than a month of food for her. So that's wonderful. We appreciate it. So we got about 45 people watching. Should we talk about Helen's parents? Yeah, let's talk about Helen's parents. This is, um, this is going to be kind of a, a weird discussion that we're going to have. Um, I got a phone call uh, yesterday uh, from the wife of the breeder of Helen, the gentleman that, that has the mom and dad and has this captive breeding program. <clears throat> and he, he's been raising these birds to make them available for falconry. And, and um, the, Helen's mom and dad are an, uh, a very old pair of peregrine falcons that have been in captive breeding program uh, for decades, and, and um, you know they they you know provided you know food and shelter, and they lay eggs, and 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 they've been hatching babies, and all of that, that kind of stuff. So that we have, uh, and and then make and and Helen would have if if she had been genetically sound, you know she would have gone out to a falconer uh, uh, as a falconry bird for for the ancient art form of, of falconry for for hunting and this is where they're allowed to fly free and and be wild peregrines but still uh work in captivity well i got a phone call from his wife yesterday and uh, we've got some really really bad news and that it, that is um you know uh this this gentleman who does the captive breeding and i've known him for shoot i've known him for more than 30 years and he's a really nice fellow. Well, he um, uh, has uh, some kind of a uh, a brain infection, and and he is uh, in the hospital. He's doing very poorly. Uh, he's been in poor health for the last uh, year or so. But this is really, really bad, and really has put him down. <clears throat> and he's at this moment, certainly unable to, uh, to take care of his, his birds. His wife doesn't really understand how to take care of them properly as well. Even, um, has always been kind of his thing. 
And so basically Helen's mom and dad, which would be in, in captive vertebrate terms, uh, quite elderly. And, and, and then they've got a, uh, a three-year-old peregrine uh, female like, like Helen that is from a different breeding project that they were going to exercise for a couple, three years and then get a male and, and set up a second pair of falcons for captive breeding as well. Well, he is unable to care for these, for these animals. Um, and um, they are now looking uh, for some help as to, to who can step in and, and, and take care of them. <clears throat> um, and um, they, they asked me if, if, if I could do this. The wife did, because like I said, the husband's in the hospital and I'm, I, I really don't know how bad it is, but it sounds like it's really, really bad. Um, and with, he's had um, several small strokes and, and and it's just it's a very sad situation. So anyway, she she had asked me um, if I knew anyone if they could take these birds and, and those kinds of things. And and uh, I gave her a bunch of suggestions of, of kind of some of the steps she could take and possibly finding homes for them. And um, there's a a strong possibility that uh, they will call me back and and ask me if I would be willing uh, to take the three falcons, uh, bring them here to my rescue center. And uh, th this is uh, one of the issues that we have. Um, that this is this when you're dealing with um, federally protected migratory wildlife. This is not like puppies and kittens. Uh, there are very few people that uh, are licensed to be able to, to, to do this kind of thing. And um, so, you know, what happens um, when uh, someone like myself, or in, in this case, uh, my friend, uh, gets sick and is no longer capable, you know, what happens to the animals? And this is a question I get asked all the time. You know, my, my sweet wife and I are getting older, you know, what happens if, uh, if something happens to us? And this is kind of really drives home that issue um, with uh, dogs and cats and those kinds of things. Um, you know, you can, you know, you, like uh, Cody, if anything happened to Susan and I, you know, my daughter would take Cody. My son would take Cody. Um, all of my dog groomers at my shop would take Cody. Uh, you know, they would they would love him and he would have a, a long and healthy life if anything happened to Susan and I. But what about uh, what about Helen here? What about Scout? What about Bell? What happens to them? And that's becomes uh, a little more of a difficult question. And so, you know, we if some if I something happened to me and, and I says, well, OK, um, you know, my son would like to have, you know, my birds, but he can't because he doesn't have all of the state and federal permits to have them. And, and so he would have to go through a lengthy process and it would, you know, basically um, to start from scratch, it would take him any, you know, a good two plus years to be able to have uh, either Bell or, or Helen, the, the hawk or falcon, it would take significantly longer than that for, for the eagle. And, and so to find someone that is capable and, and has the facilities and is able to take them when you're dealing with these animals is, is quite the issue. And so um, it, it, there's a lot of questions that I don't have the answers to with Helen's parents. Um, the first, the first one is, um, it, uh, do they know someone else or can they find somebody else that they would prefer that the birds go with? Because, you know, I, I'm not, um, I'm not big into uh, uh, the captive breeding. I'm, I'm more into the wildlife rescue um, and return everything back to the wild. Now, the younger peregrine that's three years old that they have, 
there would be a potential for me to take that bird in, exercise the bird thoroughly, make sure that it it's hunting well, and reintroduce it back to the wild uh, like I've done so many, many other ones in the past. So that's a possibility. But what do you do with, uh, you know, a 20-year-old pair of birds that, that are, they're, they're no longer uh, successful breeders, so they can't really be on a, on a breeding permit. They have never been touched in decades as far as handling like Helen, so they, they, they can't really be used as educational animals, uh, and they can't be used for falconry birds because they, they're not trained and they haven't flown and they're very, very old. And so that, that's really up in the air as to what, what's going to happen. Not only do I have to be willing to take them or, or whoever would be willing to take them, but now we have to justify why we, why we would keep them uh, both uh, through, in this case, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service would have to agree that this is the best situation. And, and so it becomes extremely complicated uh, when you come into these kinds of situations. Um, and, and so, you know, if if um, we can get all of the state and federal uh, permissions, uh, if the, the the family feels they want to to uh, to have the birds with me. Um, like I said, I, the, the, the pair, Helen's mom and dad, um, they would, they would just be in a chamber like they have been for decades, uh, together, uh, un until they pass away of old age. Um, there would really be nothing more that I could do with them, uh, and try to, uh, take the younger one, get it, uh, physically fit and either get it returned back to the wild or get it placed with with a falconer that wants to use it for what it, what its original purpose was, was which was to be uh, a bird used in the ancient art of falconry. So this is a uh, lots of questions, lots of lots of things that I, I really don't know. Over the next um, few days, there's going to be a lot of long conversations uh, if they decide they want the the birds to come come to my center. Uh, and, um, you know, where we're going to put them, how we're going to take them, you know, and that's one of the, again, one of the issues that we have is, um, you know, I only keep three, uh, wildlife ambassadors and that's a, a good thing. Basically the hawk, eagle, and falcon is, you know, is wonderful for doing the educational programs to show an example of each and use them for education, but, um, you do not want to keep um, too many wildlife ambassadors because for every every wildlife ambassador that you keep permanently takes up a facility space uh, out, out and away from the wildlife rescue. And, and so if I bring these three birds in, you know, that's going to take up two, maybe three of my current facilities uh, away from as we're going into spring, which is our busiest time, away from the facilities that we need for for all of the uh, wildlife that, that come in that, that need the facilities. And uh, so, it's, so there's a lot lot to consider about this. Um, I, I told uh, the family that, uh, you know, I, I would do whatever I, I could do uh, legally to make sure that, that the animals are are properly cared for and and are, are healthy and, and receive a good home. Uh, you know, whether the, the one goes back to the wild, the one goes to a falconer, whether we can place the, the paraparagrins somewhere or we keep them here, um, I don't know. But we will we will do our best as we always have to to care for the animals. So if uh, Helen's parents have never been like the manning right they're they're not really truly falcon birds they're breeding pair that means she can never really be with them either right because you can't go in there and get her with her other with her parents there they have to be separate wouldn't they oh absolutely no ba basically um they 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 were 
initially, uh, but we're talking, you know, 20 years ago, they were initially uh, a falconry birds. Uh, for whatever reason, they, they, in most cases, they, they, the, the falconers were not successful. And so they were given to a captive breeder for which they were then put in a, in a chamber uh, together. There is a, uh, a significant uh, courtship situation where uh, you cannot just introduce what would be considered uh, a strange uh, bird into that chamber. They, they won't accept it. They, they'll kill it. And so if I were to take Helen and put it back with, with mom and dad, uh, the mom and dad would kill her immediately because they, they don't recognize her as their child. They ba once um, once the, the, the parent bond is broken and the young go, go off to do their thing and the parents do their thing, um, if, if the young even come back um, you know, a year or two later, back to the nesting territory, the parents will drive the chicks off because they don't recognize it as their chick. They recognize it as an intruder to their territory. So, so this is not something that um, this is not not something that, like you and I, this is not a kind of a, uh, a would be a wonderful family reunion. Get mom and dad back together with their baby. That's that's not how this works. This is strictly uh, as far as they were concerned that Hel Helen would be uh, an intruder into their territory, and and if they couldn't drive it out of the territory, of course in a chamber you can't do that because you're confined. Uh, then then it would then the intruder would be killed. So, so we cannot, we can't put her with her mom and dad. And, and to be honest with you, Helen wouldn't recognize them as, as her mom and dad anyway. So as far as licensing, even though they're technically a breeding pair, even though they're technically older, couldn't they still be considered falconry birds and you can keep them? Cause like Thumper was, was really old and he didn't actually hunt anymore, but he got to hang out and just enjoy his retirement with you as, as a falconry bird still. Well, and that's true. And, and ba basically, um, you have to be able to justify this. Now, I, now my, my old Harris Hawk Thumper uh, was with, with me for 29 years before he passed away. And um, for, the, for the past, uh, oh, five or six years, you know, he was far too old to hunt. You know, occasionally, you know, we'd go out and we'd let him fly free. And occasionally he chased lizards, but that's about the most he would do. Uh, but he was a wonderful wildlife ambassador, was great with education, and, and um, was a very, very dear friend. And now, if I were to have taken Thumper and say, well, you know, he's no good for falconry, um, but I, and I don't want to keep him anymore, so I'm just going to transfer him to somebody else, you know, for some, let's say, um, falconer that doesn't know any better, um, that there would be an issue there because I would be transferring the bird to another falconer for the purpose of falconry, which is hunting, but he can't hunt because he's too old. And so it would be kind of going against the basic agreement uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which was why why the birds what the purpose is to have the bird in captivity <clears throat> and so you know it it's going to take a, a conversation or two hopefully that the u.s fish and wildlife service will understand that here we have a, a gentleman these birds have been in captivity um, their whole lives and, and it, this gentleman who would have just you know for the last uh, three years or so they have not been successful at at, uh, at hatching anything, and and so there is no issue with with that. But to to transfer them to somebody else as an, as a falconry bird, when they clearly are not usable for falconry, or to transfer them as a captive breeding propagation pair, and they're clearly not able to do that well anymore. The the uh, last issue would be education and because i do have an education permit that they would most likely be end up on on my education permit and then and then kept for uh as long as long as they live but 
again, they're, they were, they're just going to be, uh, you know, this is not simple. This, this is, um, we are dealing with, like I said, uh, federally protected migratory wildlife. Um, and, and we do have to cross our T's and dot our I's and, and, and make sure that everybody is in agreement. Um, you know, I, I don't want the, uh, uh, fish and wildlife service coming to my house and, uh, and say, well, those those can't be used. You know, you don't can't have that on your falconry permit because it can't be used for falconry. Right. And and then get into trouble. Well, we've got a super chat here from Lisa Lex Photography, and she says, "Wow, did you know you can give ten dollars? That's so easy. And what fun if we could get everybody to just give ten bucks right now? Let's try it." She's doing a little fundraising for us there. Thank you, Lisa. That's so kind of you. And yes. Uh, every every little bit helps. Uh, like like I said, um, you know, you know, if I when I get the mice on sale, they're more than, they're a little more than a dollar a piece. If I have to pay full price for them, they're like two bucks a piece. And so that buys anywhere from you know five to ten mice. Um, you know, Helen here eats about uh, uh, depends on the size of the mice. Uh, you know, three to five mice a, a, a day. Or, or a, uh, a half a full-grown quail or a three-quarter size quail that you'll eat a whole one. So, that, so it, it is expensive to feed these guys. And so your, your donations really, really help. And I guess we should note, too, that when you donate through this stream, because we're an official nonprofit and all dialed in with uh, YouTube, we get 100%. So they don't take anything out. They give it all to us. And I can also add, I'm also involved in a, a YouTube like tester program, and they send you, um, what do you call it, like rewards for having helped them out. And all that goes to the critters as well. So yeah, YouTube, that's pretty cool. Yeah, YouTube has, has been... Uh a real wonderful supporter of, of who we are and what we do and, and having that venue in which we can reach out to the world. Uh, you guys literally around the world have, uh, been the lifeblood of our foundation. Um, we couldn't do what we do without you. And we're so grateful for each and every one of you for <clears throat> helping to, to, like I said, uh, donations, but also for helping to spread the word. Um, I hope that the education that we provide through these videos are, are being spread around the world to help protect these beautiful animals. And so we're very grateful to all of you. And John Lindsay said, uh, you can just put them on your educational program. That's all. Pretty much. That's it. Pretty much. That's it. And, and, uh, and, and so again, it's, it's, Certainly one of those things that, um, you know, uh, like I said, there's just, there, there's just a lot of, a lot of questions and that we're going to have, <clears throat> we want to make sure that, that, that this is done correctly. Um, so, th so that we have it as, as a legal situation. So, so being able, to, like I said, put them on a falconry license really isn't potentially an option and captive breeding probably is not either. So the, the only option is, is to add them to my um, education permit. So this is great. A lot of our friends have found us, even though we just popped up all of a sudden. Amanda says, hello, Martin and DG. Happy anniversary, Helen. So glad to be able to tune in live. Well, thank you, Amanda. And, and yeah, welcome. Um, and, and Helen, thanks you too. Uh, you know, like I said, and she was kind of that situation that we talked about. You know, here here is a, a bird that has a genetic defect. Um, she cannot be used for falconry. She cannot be returned back to the wild. So she we couldn't put her on our on our rehabilitation permit. We couldn't uh, put her on my falconry permit because she was not a candidate for either. And and so the the only option for her was to add her onto an education permit so that she could be a wildlife ambassador and, and educate the public. And for what she's been wonderful at, and uh, and she's like I said, she sees well enough that that uh, as long as food is within close range, she can see it and feed herself, and she can jump down and she can take her bath off her perch, and she can uh, and she, so she can live a a really nice, comfortable life. Uh, she's not totally blind, which is a good thing. And we got a couple of super chats coming in. One ninety nine from EGC one 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 seven. Keep up the amazing work. Well, thank you, uh, EGC. That's very kind of you. And one from Dory, 
keep up the amazing work. Super chat for $10. Thank you, Dory. Uh, and again, you've been a great supporter. We, we thank you so much. And we've got, I think, probably someone new to the game. Roy's Place says, do you allow Helen to fly free or is it too risky that Helen won't come back to you? We do not allow Helen to fly free for the simple fact that she cannot see well enough that if if she were if 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 she were to pull away from me and this was to come off and she were to fly a, out across the field first of all she couldn't find me even if she wanted to come back but she she could not see fences she couldn't see a power lines she couldn't see to be honest with you she probably couldn't even see a building until it was as fast as she could fly she couldn't see a building until it was too late uh, she couldn't see cars she could you know she really couldn't see well enough and so it, for her to to be allowed to fly free would be a death sentence for her. Well, got another friend, BK, BM, sorry, BM. He sent us $10. Greetings to Helen and the team. Sorry, BM. I'm not even trying to pronounce your whole name. I'll just go by your initials. Thank you so much. Uh, the $10, like I said, it's really, really helps us take care of the critters. And, and we're so grateful for that. And Sam the Man is here. He says, Martin, how's Bell doing? Bell is doing wonderful. The The falconry season is officially over. Um, and so she has she is just uh, been she now eats all that she wants to eat, and she's just this uh, this big pretty couch potato. Uh, and and she will be that way until um, we get into uh, September when the when the falconry season starts up again. So right now she just uh, she gets her personal time just like Helen does uh, every day with with me. She gets to go outside and sit on the perches in the in the weathering yard and bathe all the food she wants. So she's just kind of fat and sassy and and uh, relaxing until the season starts again. But uh, in, in wonderful health. I've got a comment from Barbara Yu. I love watching you, Martin, your wife, your dog, and all your beautiful raptors. What an interesting program you have. Thank you, Martin. Well, thank you, Barbara. Uh, we, we appreciate that. And, um, and, I, I, and I know I've, I've received a lot of um, concerns over the years, uh, especially the last few years. You know, obviously I'm older and obviously, you know, it, it, for our wildlife foundation to continue you know we have got to get um our everything set up so that the the wildlife foundation no longer needs me and that's that is our big big effort right now is to get the get our enoch wildlife rescue facilities going um let me tell you the kind of bring you up to speed real quick the great news is um because of the, the love and appreciation that uh, the city that I live in, which is Enoch, Utah, <clears throat> has for who we are and what we do. Um, they have uh, leased us property for a brand new facility um, for a dollar a year for the next 100 years with an option to renew that lease at that price twice. So the, so the property is, is well secured for, for our foundation, for our wildlife rescue center. Um, we have raised the money to build a really, really state-of-the-art raptor rehabilitation facility, which will consist of two um, 20 foot wide by 40 feet or 100 feet long eagle chambers um, to give the eagles uh, a much larger area in which to exercise before they get released back to the wild. And along with that, there will be 15 um, uh, smaller chambers for hawks and falcons and owls and those kinds of things. And then, and then an on-site veterinary clinic, which um, will all, all be part of, part of the, new, the brand new facility. The brand new facility is five minutes from my home here in Enoch. And uh, right now, we have got the property is fenced. We have the property... Uh, you know, secured now. We have uh, the Eagle Flight Chamber building has been ordered, and I'm hoping that it will be delivered uh, sometime in May. I have uh, working with 
uh, a structural engineering firm uh, to uh, do the soils testings. In fact, uh, we just uh, gave them uh, some more money yesterday to to get uh, to get the, the footings designed and to get the built to get the extra parts of the building designed. <clears throat> and so we're, we are moving ahead very, very quickly with a brand new center. And then once we get this brand new center up and going, we will we will triple the amount of facilities that we have for the animals that we have that, that we rescue. And um, so I will I will have a place that I will be able to train. And I do have some a couple of people in mind that would like to literally step into to my job and take over uh, in the next few years. And so we're looking to to get some people trained now. Now you do have to understand, you know, you know, even though we are a volunteer wildlife rescue facility, nobody's dumb enough to do what I do for free. And, and so they they will uh, we will have to have things set up to the point that we can uh, afford to have some employees that we can count on uh, for, time for the facility. But we're moving ahead with all of this. Um, so, so the things are really, really looking up for us. Um, I'm so grateful to the city of Enoch. I'm so grateful for all of our corporate sponsors that have helped us so much and got a feather on my nose. Make my nose itch kiddo. So, so things, things are looking up. Uh, I, I really do hope, uh, I'm 66 years old by the time I turn 70. I, I am really, really hoping that we will be es established at the point. I, I'll, you know, I'll continue to work. You know, I, I believe retirement for me means that somebody drops me in a hole six foot deep and throws dirt over my face. Uh, and so I will work until I die. But I do. But we will hopefully be in that situation where, if something does happen to to Susan and I, that the foundation will. Uh, continue forever. So that's our goal. Well, Amanda also sent us a super chat of $20 and she adds that she can't wait to come out and visit again. David and I enjoyed it so much. Well, thank you, Amanda. That's so sweet of you. That's, like I said, every little bit helps. We're, we're so grateful for everyone. And we got a comment from Corey who says Black Hills Raptor Center has a 34 year old red tailed hawk who has recently been retired as an education bird. Absolutely. You, you know, on average, uh, most large hawks and falcons on, on average in the wild, you know, seven to, seven to 10 years is kind of normal. Uh, they can go a little longer than that. In captivity, we can double that 15 to 20 years. Uh, but some of the larger ones, and a red-tailed hawk is a great example, my Bell the Harris hawk, um, you know, going over 30 is, is certainly a possibility. Um, you know they're 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 no longer able for use for falconry. <laughs> to sit on your glove and and to uh, to introduce the public into how beautiful these birds and how intelligent they are, and their values within the ecosystem, uh, we can do that with them for, like I said, thirty years. So it's 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 a very very long relationship. Budokan says, Martin, is there any kind of subspecies variation between peregrines with yellow colorations around their eyes? Well, here's, here's the, 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 the yellow coloration that you see around her eye. That's, that is the, that's the, the eyelid. That's the skin around the eye and the eyelid. And, and um, that's pretty normal for, for most birds of prey. The younger ones, that's gray. But uh, once they get fully mature, they get a little more yellowish. And also the skin right on her nose right here, um, as, as a youngster, that is more gray than, than it is yellow. Uh, we have um, prairie falcons, which are even more gray. But again, they go yellow as they get a little bit older. I'd have to look at all the other falcon species to see if there's anything that doesn't carry that yellow. But I, I can't think of any right offhand. EGC asked, do we get to look forward to some bell hunting videos soon? I hope so. Um, the problem that we had this last year, uh, to be, we did zero hunting with bell this year. I did take bell out and I did let her fly on pigeons and get, get some exercise. But as far as 
actual hunting, we did not hunt this year. And the reason that we did not hunt is um, a year and a half ago, uh, we had a devastating uh, disease come through called rabbit hemorrhagic disease. And the rabbit hemorrhagic disease literally just wiped out the jackrabbit population and did significant damage to the cocktail population that we have here in southern Utah. And it's done this in other states as well, but not just southern Utah. Um, it's, uh, I, I did not want to put any additional stress on an already damaged population. Now, Bell is, is a very efficient hunter. Uh, Bell, in a, in a good season, will get between 80 and 100 rabbits you know, uh, in, around this area. I did not want to do that. And, and so we purposefully did not go out and hunt rabbits this year. We wanted to give the rabbit population uh, an opportunity to recover. There are a few rabbits, but very few. And, and so hopefully this spring, if everything looks good, that they'll have a, a you know, if we have, if the drought isn't as severe, if um, a lot of environmental issues line up properly, and we have a really, really good breeding season for the uh, the rabbits, then I then I could see um, taking Bell out and hunting rabbits again, and Scout out as well, and hunting some rabbits again uh, next fall through through winter. Uh, but again, it's uh, it's really is my responsibility. You just turn me off. I can still hear you. You can still hear me. Yeah. Can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. I can see. Okay. I can see Helen too. Okay. Well, I my screen went off. Oh really? So maybe it's the, the screensaver. Did. Went to sleep or something. Oh, that's interesting. Or maybe it's. Well, as long as you got, I'm not going to touch anything. As long as you guys <laughs> can hear me. Okay. That's, that's all that really matters. All right. Or, but right right now, I'm just on my home screen, and I don't, I can't, I can hear you, but I can't see you. Wow. So, so I'm not going to touch anything. So I don't. So I don't end up messing something up here. But um, anyway, so that's that's why um, I, I I think it's extremely important for all of us um, who deal with wildlife to to make those kinds of assessments. You know, if you if if the waterfowl population is down, don't hunt ducks. If the deer population is down, don't hunt deer. The hunting should be used as a biological tool to control overpopulation. And, and so if we are not in an overpopulation situation, we, we really uh, should be very, very careful not to, to damage uh, the population's um, hump, humperty girl. And, and so that's, that's why. So it was um, the, first, the first time in 50 years that uh, I did not go out and actively hunt with my birds. And so it's, it was, um, you know, it was a bit of a sad year for us because I, I love to let these guys fly and let them be wild and do their thing. But uh, I, I also have to be responsible and, and, and allow the, the rabbit population to recover. Yeah, I always ask. It'd be nice if you could just go out in the in the desert and just walk with Belle. But you said if you do that, she just gets bored because she's like she's not hunting, so it's just nothing to her. Yeah, no, that that's that's exactly right. She, you know, they are motivated to hunt. Oh, let me. I'm going to push a button. I hope I don't go away. <laughs> okay. Ah, I can see. There you can, I can see, see you the video again. Now. Okay, what did you do? I just hit the. Um, uh, uh, panic button? Yeah, the panic button. No, I, ju I, I just I just hit the uh, um, Microsoft. Um, just drew a blank as to the word uh, uh, where you wander the internet. See, this is why I've got a job, peeps. This is why Martin needs yes. a web geek. <laughs> he I just bang on the computer now at work. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I, I'm very very capable of admitting and happy to do so 
you know, when it comes to computers, I'm dumb as a brick. I'm really good with things that fly. And the only time my computer flies is when I get frustrated and it doesn't fly very well. So, so uh, I'm grateful that you're all willing to put up with me and, and, and all of this silliness. Uh, so yeah, uh, without, without uh, DG helping me, um, none of this internet stuff would be possible. And browser, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> browser. And well, I, we also got some more help. help. We got some more help with a, a super sticker from KD. She sent nine ninety nine. He or she sent nine ninety nine, and a some sort of picture that's not showing up. And we also got one from it's a crying shame. She sent five. He or she sent five dollars. And again, another well, image that we can't see on the screen here, though. Well, thank you, thank you, guys. It, I so appreciate it. Like I said, it's it's. Uh, it means a lot to, to all of us and to the critters as well. That we're, you know, you you are what makes it possible. And we got a question from Salty Stir Fry. Do your volunteers need to have falconry permits? No, no, they do not need to have a falconry permit. Um, uh, for for someone, they do um, they do need to be able to develop the the experience necessary you know mo most of my volunteers i'll be really honest with you the vast majority of volunteers um aren't working with the animals the vast majority of the volunteers are doing things like um you know helping to plant trees at our new facility helping to uh clean cages helping to set up uh fundraisers uh all of the things that we need to do for the foundation to run and it's those volunteers that are willing to to kind of do the the less romantic kinds of projects these are the ones that that as i need someone to step in to help me with the animals they're going to be asked first and, and so if any of you have have read my book healer of angels uh you will remember the story of my my dear mentor who taught me falconry and, and uh, his name was Hubert Wells. He owned Animal Actors of Hollywood. If you get a chance, read that story, and and uh, you will understand that um, the only way that I became who I am wa was because um, I was too dumb to quit. And Hubert just basically gave me every dirty job that you could possibly imagine until he decided that I was I was going to stick around. And and at that point then, then the, my volunteerism got a lot more interesting. Okay, we have one more question here from Adam. Is there anything different you do when training a passage falcon and a passage red tail? Yes, we go one more step. Now, um, let me run through this. It so sounds like, like you're, you're a falconer, so let me run through this for you. <clears throat> um, really quickly, you trap a passage red-tailed hawk. Now, please, everybody understand this is perfectly legal when you have the proper licenses and permits and, and everything to get your 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 falconry bird. And a red-tailed hawk is a great choice. It is a great, not only first bird, but it's a great bird for an experienced falconer who, who wants to raise the level of, of his skill. So red-tailed hawks are wonderful. You trap your red-tailed hawk. Um, you get your equipment put on the red, you get your, your hawk home, you get the equipment on the bird, you, you get get the right hood, the right jessies, the uh, an, the ulmary anklets, the bells, all the equipment get on the bird. Um, weigh your bird, write down that weight. And that weight means almost nothing. But what you want to do is for the next couple of weeks, you want to have the bird on your glove 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if it's possible. You want that bird to be with you. Um, this is called manning, where you acclimate the bird to you, to, to the environment, take the bird for walks, introduce it to the family, to the, to the dog, to everybody. Um, like me, I would take the bird to, to, to work with me every day. The, the, the bird, literally, uh, I never left the birds, I would never leave the bird's sight for the first two weeks and and if you never have to leave the bird site, period, that's wonderful. But for the first two weeks, you want to be present with the bird. And all the time that, that you are with that bird, you have food 
right here. You have something for that bird to eat and let the bird eat all that it wants. Um, literally around the clock, you've got food. And, the, and once the bird, after a day or two, starts to settle in a little bit and figures out that you're not going to hurt it and that things are, uh, and that there's food available, the bird will start eating freely and you let it eat for two weeks, let it eat all that it wants. And then at that point, after two weeks of the bird eating all that it wants and the bird is nice and fat, you put that bird on a scale. Once the, you set it on the scale and you weigh your bird and you write down, that's one of the most important um, numbers that you can possibly have as a falconer. You write down that number when your bird is nice and fat. We call that the base weight. And what that, and then from that point of base weight, now you subtract 10% of that and you subtract 20% of that. And so somewhere between that 10 and 20 percent range of weight reduction is the right weight for your bird to fly. Now, some birds take a tiny bit more. Some birds will take a tiny bit less. And you determine that by the bird's behavior. And then once you start to bring the bird's weight down, then you, that's that's when you start to uh, put the bird on a perch and whistle for it to jump to your glove. And then you extend the distance from a foot to three feet to 10 feet to 50 feet, and the bird's flying back and forth to your glove. At this time, you have a string called a creance on the bird in a nice open area that the string doesn't get tangled. Once you've done that, and the bird is doing that uh, very comfortably. Um, then, you, then you do the same thing again, only use the lure, which is a leather sack, as a, as a retrieval device for the bird. So you have the leather sack. You tie food on, you throw the leather sack on the ground, the bird flies down eats part of its meal off the leather sack, the rest of its meal, it jumps up on your glove for the rest of its meal. So the bird gets used to catching its quarry and then leaving it and coming back up on the glove. And then once you've got that done, now we take into the next, to the extra step with a falcon. Now with a hawk, you're pretty much ready. You, your bird's coming to you comfortably. You understand the bird's uh, weight. You understand the metabolism and you've logged all of this stuff. You've kept a record. And so it so it starts to become very clear what the bird's appropriate flying weight is. Now that you have that and the bird's flying really well to the lure, then you put the bird on a on a post uh, a distance away, and you bring that lure out that the bird is used to flying to, and you dangle the lure about a about a foot off the ground, whistle for your bird because every time you feed the bird you whistle, and the bird flies to the lure and the thing's off off the ground and it will fly down, land on the ground jump, grab the lure, and you let it have its breakfast. And um, once it does that comfortably, then you basically kind of slightly, very slowly swing the lure. The bird flies to the lure. You blow the whistle, the bird flies to the lure. You swing it up toward the bird. The bird grabs the lure, takes it to the ground. Wonderful. You're making progress here. Once you've got, once you're doing that, and the bird sees that lure and comes to it and you swing it and it catches it, it'll start coming faster and faster and faster. And then when it, the bird looks like it's going to come really, really fast to, to your lure, you, t you, you take that lure and you've gone through the whole process and you, and you gently kind of swing the lure up and down a little more aggressively. And as the bird comes toward the lure, you swing it up in front of the bird, the bird reaches for the lure, you bring the lure, let the lure fall back down and then swing it over the top. And the bird will go and try to chase the lure. The thing goes over the top. The bird pitches up behind you. And as it pitches up behind you, looks back, saying, what happened? He says, well, you missed it. And then at that point, you drop the lure on the ground. The bird flies down and catches the lure. That's one stoop to the lure. And then you slowly increase from one stoop to the lure. Do you swing it out of the way twice? Do you swing it out of the way four times, five times, 10 times, 20 times? 50 times, and so you're out in the field, the bird is flying free, the bird circles around, comes to the, comes at the lure, you blow the whistle, it's coming to the lure, you swing out of the way, the bird pitches up, turns around, dives back down, swings it out of the way again, pitches up, and that's called, that's called um, lure training, and the bird climbs up and dives and climbs and dives and climbs and dives, building up its flight muscles, building up its agility and its skill, and uh, once the bird is flying really, really strong to the lure, then you take the next step to, inter to introduce the bird to altitude. And, and, I, and I know I've, that's probably way more than what most people wanted to hear. But, what, but uh, 
that is the purpose for the lure is to be able to get the bird physically fit enough and also as a retrieval device. So if the bird hesitates coming back to your glove, it will oftentimes come back to the lure, you know, uh, six feet away from you. And so it gives you an option. Done? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry. I, I tuned out I... after like the second word. But didn't he ask the difference? Well, basically, <laughs> I what, what I basically said was, with that, at the red-tailed hawk, once the bird has just come to the lure on the ground, now it's time to go hawking but with the falcon. And then I explained the lure training process, which is oh. the difference. Oh, I see. Okay, and plus, there's a, you got a ton of videos where you go over that more detail, right? All the Piper videos. I I do. I I do uh, on our YouTube channel. I have a lot of videos showing the process. So we're at our we're at our hour. We are. Uh, I'm so grateful to everybody. Any last questions before we? Uh, we call it a day and and get get oh Helen put outside where she can have her breakfast where she'll be and get her bath and so she'd be happy. Well, we have one. Um, do you still have Sirius the Prairie Falcon? I found some old videos of her. No, she's back in the wild. Okay, I guess we're good. All right. Well, thanks guys for for joining us and uh, and of course if you have questions you can always. Uh, you email us and I'd be happy to, to try to help you out. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.